Hi there, Simon Wolf. Uh, I'd just like to introduce you to this neat little instructional DVD. I hope that it whets your appetite because it's got lots of tips and treats within and uh, it should uh, give you a, a great deal of inspiration as to my passion which is um, photography or the art of photography. You'll get an understanding of apertures, shutter speeds and ISO and you'll also get uh, a really good um, appreciation of how a working professional meets challenges and assignments in the day-to-day -day running of his business. Some of the tips have been learned through years of experience while others are absolute prerequisites to take compelling and, and fantastic images. The fun aspects have been covered in this DVD as well as the practical and creative elements of photography and I think that you're going to enjoy this so uh, watch, learn and be entertained. It doesn't really matter what camera you use, basically it's what's six inches behind that counts and whether you're using a highly specced uh, digital single lens reflex like this Nikon or whether it's a mid to lower end digital SLR like uh, this, this little Canon here or even a compact camera like, like this little Canon, the, the thing is that it's important that you're thinking about a little bit more than, than shooting on fully automatic. Shutter speed, aperture and ISO are all interrelated. Shutter speed affects the artistic look of your photo. It's the length of time that the shutters open and that the light hits your sensor on your camera. If you want to capture the action, stop the motion, um, say a bird, you know, a seagull flying through the sky, then you would be using a, a shorter shutter speed, say a thousandth of a second, and that will ensure that the bird is absolutely stopped in its tracks and it's tack sharp. I have now set the shutter speed to 800th of a second and I'm, I'm gonna, oh, there's a seagull up there and I am gonna catch him and he is gonna be as sharp as and you won't hear much of a, a lag on the shutter. He has been caught and he is absolutely beautifully tack sharp within the frame of my camera and that's because I've got a faster shutter speed in operation. A slow shutter speed quite often will give you a blurred shot. Say the same seagull and you want to make him blurred and arty. Well, you know, uh, a shutter speed of say a fifteenth of a second to a, to a few seconds will, will, will do that and it will give you a totally different type of effect. With a slow shutter speed of say a sixtieth of a second or longer, it's really difficult to, to hand hold the camera. So it's really important that you use a tripod to keep things steady. ISO is the sensitivity of the camera to light and the amount of light that hits the sensor and it, it sort of affects how grainy or noisy the image will be. The higher the ISO, the noisier the shot's going to be, but also the higher the ISO, the less light that you're going to need. And say at 6400, you can pretty much shoot in, in near darkness. Low ISO is always going to give you great quality. Say 100 ISO outside on a sunny day, that's going to give you just the most perfect result. Sometimes a tripod is, is beneficial, especially in a, in a night situation where you're looking for uh, something to be crisp and you're using longer shutter speeds where you can't hand hold easily without there being motion. And I think it's important to realise that the other area of, of a tripod is that when you're wanting to gain maximum depth of field, which is what we're going to talk about next, that's aperture, that a tripod is um, also advantageous in that situation because you can pop your, your, your camera on a tripod, you can still have a quality setting in relation to ISO, 100, 200, 400, and everything's absolutely still and you'll be able to get your, your depth of field right throughout. Aperture is the way which the camera shutter opens and closes and the amount of light that it lets in. At f22, um, you've got a very small opening, but that's maximum depth of field. Whereas at f1.4, you've got a very wide opening and not a lot of depth of field at all. Think of it like a tube of toothpaste. A small aperture, say f22, uh, will be a narrow little bead of toothpaste and that will give you a, a, a great depth of field. Whereas at f2.8, which is wide open, will give you a, a, a bigger drop of toothpaste and will give you a really shallow depth of field. You know, the, the, the same amount of light, but a totally different result. Let me show you with Hospi at Carluchland. First with maximum aperture, the camera wide open. We've got 
a very shallow depth of field, which means that my f-stop is wide open. And on this camera and with this lens, it's 5.3. I focus right here on Hospi's eye. Hospi's eye will be sharp. Hospi's nose will be starting to taper off, and then the dragon's nose won't be sharp at all. And also, anything from here back won't be sharp either. So the depth of field is around this very tiny little area here. We've shot the last image at a thousandth of a second at f5.3, which was absolutely wide open. And now we've gone to f11, which is a medium range sort of aperture. So hopefully we're looking for a little bit more crispness and sharpness throughout the image. In doing that, we've sacrificed speed. So we're, we're now down to 3 20th of a second. It's still, you're still able to hand hold a camera at 3 20th of a second. And uh, we're gonna pop the, the shutter and uh, see where the, the sharpness lays with, with, with Hospi. It's a great mid-range aperture. The next image that we're gonna shoot is at F22, which is the least opening in the uh, and the whole thing. Everything will be sharp from here right down the back there. So we're gonna pop this off. Just gonna look through here and just make sure. Focused on Hospi's eyes again. And yes, we are sharp right the way through. Of course, I'm not saying that one style is better than the other. It's a matter of what effect you want. And then also working the functions like aperture, ISO, and shutter speed, and practicing, experimenting again, and, and seeing what works best for you. There's usually a wheel to choose which one of them has the priority setting. M is for manual. That gives you complete and utter control um, over your exposures and your, shut, your, your shutter speeds both ways. We'll then go to P, which is professional, where the camera sets it for you. It's actually for program in reality, but a lot of us say P for professional because you could almost on a gray day set your camera at 400 ISO and uh, you know, this, this is a nice overcast wraparound day. You could do a whole job on, on P and it would take beautiful photos for you, but you don't necessarily have a hell of a lot of control. Although in some of the, the medium range cameras, you can use your wheels to control shutter speed and aperture if you know what you're doing, but it's totally reliable uh, as being a, um, in, in reasonable light, fail safe. Moving around again, you've got your S for your shutter speed. And on a Canon camera, it, it's, it comes up as being TV, not S. So that's um, the value of the time. Time value, I think that means. And then you've got your aperture, which is A. And moving right at, along again, you've got your, your manual. So, you know, it, you move around and you've got a number of um, creative controls on your on your camera, which, which are vitally important. On some of the the um, entry level cameras, you also have your, your portrait mode, your sport mode, and your landscape mode, and perhaps a macro mode as well. A lot of the entry level cameras and, and the compacts have um, additional settings on them. So this one has an auto setting. So pretty much, uh, if there wasn't enough light in the room here, um, I could push the, the shutter release, and I'll just hold it, I'll, I'll turn the camera on first, that's helpful, and I'll just poke it against my arm here, which is pretty dark. And, yep, look there, the flash just popped up by itself. And I've just, it's just allowed me to take a photo of my arm, not a great shot. But say you're in a dark situation and there's not enough light, you haven't got um, a, a big enough ISO, or there's just not enough light, that flash will pop up if you've got it set to the, the totally auto setting. So that, that can be a, an advantage, although with what I do, um, I actually um, tend to, to dissuade myself from using flash a lot and I turn the flash off completely. So on the back, some of these little cameras actually have little help sheets for you, um, or little help um, sentences or paragraphs, and that's a, a pretty good guide. So if I go through here, for instance, um, on the flash side of things, it's off, flash will not fire, flash automatically fires as needed, and, and now it's off completely. So, yeah, pretty, pretty foolproof. Flash is an area that's pretty interesting and, and, and trips a lot of people up. I have a 
kiss mentality as far as flash is concerned, and that's keep it simple, stupid. Uh, I like to have control with my flash, and that's why uh, we carry both dedicated flashes, um, which does everything for you, which is completely fail safe, um, through to flashes that you can handle in a manual sort of sense and you can just power them up to what you want. We find that powering them up to what you want is, is a good thing at times, uh, basically because you've got that level of control that, that, that you feel that you need and that you can see what the result is on the back of the camera. So that's pretty good. But if you're wanting to work really, really quick, uh, well then dedication is the way to go. A lot of people say that you really shouldn't use flash over the lens uh, too much, um, unless you really need to. Now there's, there's things that occur when your flash is straight over your lens, and a lot of you would have um, already realized that, that you sometimes get red eye. Well, a flash over the lens is, is the sign of, um, you know, red eye is quite often a sign of that. Uh, with just firing like that, it's, it's pretty easy. You get a result. Um, but poor old Hospy here, he's actually um, he's actually not looking um, too bad. But by firing a flash in this way, you've got big, huge shadows. And quite often what we do is that we'll lift the flash up and I'll just bounce a little bit of light off my hand into Hospy. And Hospy, Hospy looks pretty cool now. Whereas before, Hospi looked as though he had huge shadows and it wasn't very contoured. Sometimes what we do is that we also bring in another light. And uh, I quite often use a little torch for this. And so that you've got some contouring around the, the area. Um, and I might just bounce off the roof just a little bit. And yep, yeah, so we've fired a little shadow out onto this side here, and this side of Hospi is quite nicely lit, so that's creating a third dimension. Uh, and in other situations, we'll, we'll use our manual flash, and we'll just power that up. And I've got a little light sensor here, a little slave, and we'll just plug that into here, and fingers crossed, and this is, this is a very um, simple, effective way of of lighting, but you know, I'd hold this, whether it's hospi or a subject, I'd either hold this from my hand or pop it on a little tripod, uh, but this light here is being used as the trigger for this flash unit here. Uh, here we go. Yes, fantastic. So in firing this light, this was my, my trigger, and this was my main light, and hospi is beautifully lit. You actually don't need um, sophisticated equipment uh, to, to use in a, a lighting sort of situation. We've got a little white piece of polystyrene here, and we've got some light coming on on the other side, and I'm, I'm just popping that there, and that's actually bouncing off the light that's uh, coming into, the, um, in, into this room, and it's bouncing some lovely portrait light into here. So we've got a little bit of reflected light there. I'm not sure if you can see that adequately on Hospi, but it's definitely there. So there's more light on this side now than there was previously, if I take that away. Uh, but another thing that I do with, say, a little piece of uh, polystyrene like this is that you can also bounce that off your flash. And that's much softer. Lovely soft light is now now hitting, hitting Hospi and it's not so harsh as just firing something in just like this. And it's even more complimentary than just firing off a white roof. I'm just gonna pop this up here. And you can do this again, just with something like this. And it just softens off any shadows. Now when I'm shooting this way, um, and this is in the vertical sort of format, because the flash is on the side, you will get a shadow that comes across onto the other side. So it just depends on what you're looking for, but using flash correctly can soften something or it can create more drama and effect to something as well. So hopefully that gives you a, an overall understanding of the basics. Now it's just a matter of um, going on to some of the other clips and uh, having some fun with your photography.